And so a great big welcome for those of you joining us this day. It's the fourth Sunday of Lent, and together we're continuing our journey with the Lord to the foot of the cross. I'm glad that you are with us. Uh, I know that uh, many of you are at home, probably sipping your coffee, wear your bathrobes, and there are those in the church. But wherever we are together, we are God's church. And just glad to have you. I also remind you that if, the, if you're able, we'd love to have you come in person. We miss a lot of our friendly faces. I know many of you are watching online, but those that are able, uh, we would love to welcome you. We have your pew all warmed up and ready to go. So uh, uh, when you're able, please come. And if you need help or transportation, let us know, and we'll see if we can help uh, help, help you with that. Uh, service today, it's uh, probably a very familiar verse, uh, verses, I should say, uh, that we're familiar with. It's from John chapter 3. And I think you all know that chapter 3 uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But it's a verse that follows, verse 17. And in that verse, it talks about that, that God did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world uh, through his love and his death on the cross. And I think we forget about that. And oftentimes we so quick to condemn and so quick to judge. And many of us are guilty of that. I've been guilty of that over the years as well. And I've had to ask for God's forgiveness. Ours is not to judge or condemn. Ours is to love and uh, reach out to and to bring healing and and um, and um, wholeness to the lives of people. And I think you'll um, like the the message today. I believe the and the music and the words, uh, all of it uh, wrapped up together. Uh, it hopefully, will help you in your Christian journey as together we continue uh, uh, this Lenten season. So, like I said again, glad to have you with us. And with that said, let me begin the service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Let me continue with the prayer of the day. O God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world, and you rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. And now turn the service over to our music team as they share their gifts of music. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. gospel lesson for this, the fourth Sunday of Lent, comes from the third chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is a judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light, and do not come to the light, so that the, their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The Gospel of our Lord. 
Thanks be to God. And so grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. And so let us pray. Lord, we thank you again as you gathered your people. Yes, some in their respective homes and some in the church. But wherever we are, Lord, we are your church. And so, Lord, come now. Come and continue to be with us as we continue our Lenten journeys, traveling with you to the foot of the cross. And Lord, I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts please in your sight. And this I pray. Amen. Well, a young woman posted some soul-searching thoughts on Facebook recently. Her post was in response to another Facebook post about a teenage boy in Jamaica who was beaten by his classmates. The reason he was beaten was because his father visited his son's school and informed the boy's peers that his son is gay. The young man's father had already informed this young man that he was not welcome back at home because he could not tolerate his sexuality. The father said the boy should be dead, but because he was his son, he would spare him. Can you even imagine that? The young woman, also originally from Jamaica, but now living in the States, was moved with indignation when she read the post. She said her tears fell freely. She said, how does a parent condemn their child? How? And then she pictured this young man being beaten and kicked on the floor as his, yellow, as his fellow students stood by with their hearts seemingly made of stone. The young woman, who's a devout Christian, posted a Bible verse in response to the story. It was from John chapter 3, verse 17, where it said, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. She noted that many of us have been familiar with John 3, 16 from childhood. We all know that verse, don't we? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. But she goes on to note that verse 17 is just as powerful, where it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It was a spirit of condemnation that greatly offended her, especially a father condemning his own son. We turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 34, and we read these words where it says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. The implication is that Christ does not condemn us, how can we condemn someone else? Remember the story of the woman caught in the act of adultery in John chapter 7? Jesus was in the temple courts teaching. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees had brought in a woman caught in the act of adultery. They stood her before the group and they said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus instead, he bent down, and he started to write on the ground with his finger. Some say he might have been revealing their sins. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, and he said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Again he stooped down and he wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard his words began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, till only Jesus was left with a woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and he asked her, he says, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go, go and sin no more. Think about those words. Neither do I condemn you. Jesus is the only, only one here that was blameless, the only one without sin, and yet he did not condemn the woman. He didn't pick up a stone to hurl at her. Instead, he sent her away with an instruction, telling her to simply leave her life of sin. He was completely aware that she had sinned, but Jesus wasn't in the business of condemnation. He was sent to earth to save. It's ironic that the men who condemned this woman, caught in adultery, had sinned also. Jesus was quite aware of their faults when he made his statement. Why is it that the followers of Jesus so often ignore this clear example? Remember the shame that used to be attached to a young woman pregnant out of wedlock? Her sin was public. It was out there for all to see. But Jesus knows that there are people who carry invisible sins all the time. Sins like envy, sins like bitterness and hatred, sins like having a condemning heart. But God sees those sins. So Christ instructed in Matthew when he said, Do not judge, 
or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged with the measure that you use will be measured to you. Goes on to say, and why do you look at the speck of sadness in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own? Folks, that's a stunning image. Speck of sadness in your neighbor's eye and a two by four in your own? And you're offended by your neighbor's speck while ignoring your own two by four? In other words, if you have a condemning heart, you are out of sync with the heart of Jesus. Then remember the story of the woman at the well. She was a Samaritan and she was a woman. Two reasons for Jesus to ignore her. Because back then, men did not talk to women, and especially Jews did not talk to Samaritans. But then she had a third strike against her. She had been married five times, and she was living with a man who was not her husband. Three strikes. She was a woman, a Samaritan, and living without a man, and living with a man out of wedlock. Three strikes. And she was out. Except she wasn't out, as far as Jesus was concerned. In fact, he had the longest conversation with her of any conversations recorded in the entire New Testament. And he offered her to exchange her well water for living water. Folks, he didn't condemn her. He treated her with dignity, with compassion, and with respect as a child of God. And he set an example for us in our treatment of others, whoever they may be. But there's a second thing that we also need to see. That we are not to condemn others, yes, but neither are we to condemn ourselves. See, there are some people who do not come to Christ because they do not feel that they're good enough. You may have talked with a friend about church and probably heard them say something like, oh, I'd be too embarrassed to come to church. I've got too much baggage, or, or if I come, the roof would cave in. Don't you know that's the kind of person the church was designed for? Don't they know that? Pastor Lee Strobel, he tells about doing a baptism service. He told about told people that before they came up to the platform to be baptized, that they're to take a piece of paper, write down a few of their sins that they've committed, and then fold the paper. Then he pointed to a large wooden cross that was up front, and he told them that when they came up to the front, they were to take the piece of paper, they were to take a pin, and pin that piece of paper to the cross. Because the Bible says our sins are nailed to the cross with Jesus Christ, and they're paid fully for by his death. Then they were to turn and come to the pastor to be baptized. The pastor's trouble, he then goes on to share a letter of a woman who wrote to him, who was baptized in one of those services. She wrote into that letter, she says, I remember my fear. In fact, it was the most fear I remembered in my life. I wrote as tiny as I could on that piece of paper, the word abortion. I was so scared someone would open the paper and read it and find out it was me. She said, I wanted to get up and walk out of the... Uh, out of this church during the service. The guilt and fear were that strong. But when my turn came, I walked toward the cross. And I pinned the paper there. I was directed to the pastor to be baptized. And he looked me straight in the eye, and I thought for sure he was going to read this terrible secret I kept from everybody for so, so long. But instead, she said, I felt like God was telling me, I love you, and it's okay. You've been forgiven. She said, I felt so much love for me. I, a terrible sinner. It's the first time I ever really felt forgiveness and unconditional love. She goes on to say it was unbelievable and it was indescribable. Folks, it is unbelievable and it is indescribable, but it is the wondrous love of God poured out for all who would receive it. You see, Christ came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it. And in return, we're not to condemn others. And we are not to condemn ourselves. You know, we keep bringing back to memory our sins of the past, holding them against ourselves, thinking that God is holding them against us also. But let me just say that God, God's not a historian, and he's not an archaeologist. He doesn't go around digging up our past sins. He comes into a relationship with us. He forgives us, and he restores us. Too often we forget that when Jesus died, he took our past, our present, and our future sins with him. So if you're feeling estranged from God by any past sin, I hope that you'll lay it down this day and accept Christ's forgiveness. Remember Christ's teaching that we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? Well, let me just say that some of us are too hard on ourselves. It stands as a barrier between ourselves 
and with others. More than 30 years ago, a Jesuit priest by the name of John Powell wrote a book entitled, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? The book has sold millions of copies and remains in print to this day. Powell's simple thesis is that people hide who they really are from others because of one basic fear. He describes this basic fear in an actual conversation he had with someone. Powell said to this other person, says, I'm writing a booklet to be called, Why Am I Afraid to Tell You Who I Am? Well, the other person said, do you want an answer to your question? Powell said, well, that's the purpose of the booklet, to answer the question. But the other person said, do you want my answer? Powell said, well, yes, of course I do. The other person said, and I quote, said, I'm afraid to tell you who I am, because if I tell you who I am, you may not like who I am, and it's all that I have. Some of us are too hard on ourselves. If Christ does not condemn us, who are we to condemn ourselves or others? And here's a really important thing we need to see, that when we accept ourselves and all other people as children of God, we reflect the love of Jesus Christ. That is when we truly become Christ-like, when we can accept others as he accepted us. Dr. Ken Ramsey, he tells a delightful story about a friend of his named Joel. He says he met Joel while attending seminary at Emory University in Atlanta. Joel was working on his Master of Divinity degree, and they were in the same ministry assessment group. Joel was a big guy, he did his undergraduate work at Dartmouth, and that's where he played football. Their mutual athletic interests were a common bond, and their friendship grew from there. They enjoyed jogging together at a local park. But one day they were running around this small lake located there, and Ken noticed Joel smiling. What are you smiling at? Ken asked. Joel pointed to a little girl that was fishing with her dad. She was imitating every move the dad made. If he cast, she cast. If he fixed his hat, she fixed her hat. If he sat down, she sat down. Just something about a child imitating her father that makes my heart smile, Joel replied. Well, there was a guy in the ministry assessment group, Ken says, that for some reason seemed to always be out to get Joel. No matter what Joel said, this guy would contradict him and take pains to point out how short-sighted Joel's comments were. The ministry assessment group was intense. It was an environment where they were to evaluate one another in many different areas. And this person was continually negative, demeaning, and very rude to Joel. But one day it reached a boiling point and some really harsh words were exchanged. They left the group and Joel angrily said, that guy has pushed me too far. Makes me want to run him over like I used to do on the football field. Remember, Joel was a big guy. Well, the veins in his thick neck, neck were bulging, Ken says, and it was enough to make me shake in my shoes. I would not want to be in the receiving end of anything from him, Ken admits. Well, a few days passed, it was almost time for another group meeting. The entire group could not wait to see what fireworks might occur between Joel and his enemy. The day before the group meeting, Joel and Ken were jogging in the park again. They were circling the lake, and Ken asked Joel, he said, So, have you decided how you're going to deal with that guy? Yes, I sure have, Joel replied. Ken waited for Joel to continue. I've decided, and then he paused, I've decided to forgive him. Say again, Ken said. I have decided to forgive him, Joel stated rather emphatically. Ken smiled. So what are you smiling at, Joel asked. Well, there's something about a child imitating his father that makes my heart smile, Ken said. It makes God smile when we imitate Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Powerful words life-changing words. So it is my prayer this day that we would never ever condemn anyone, including ourselves, that we would especially never stop reflecting the very nature of Christ. For I pray it, be, it may be so. And all God's people said, Amen. I want Jesus Jesus to walk with me all along my pilgrim journey. Lord, I want Jesus to walk with me.
Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so again, we want to thank you for joining us this day. We hope this service today has been helpful in your Christian journey. Please know our love and prayers are with each and every one of you. And again, if we can ever be of any help, uh, do, do not hesitate to call us or email us at the church office. And so receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see.